I should. I would. I would be. Um, so, uh, thank you all for joining us. I am Jeffrey DeRose, Director of the College of Staten Island Tech Incubator. Uh, the CSI Tech Incubator is an institution focused on driving economic growth through um, entrepreneurial programs and resources, as well as providing uh, resources around technology education. Uh, we host a, a variety of programs, uh, like our flagship incubator program for early stage tech entrepreneurs, uh, we work with the Tech Talent Pipeline. Um, some of you students are um, a part of the Tech Talent Pipeline, and we also uh, work with Girls Who Code. And once again, right, we're just here to um, give you guys knowledge and resources that can help you, you know, build a successful future. Uh, so with that being said, I'm very honored to introduce you guys to Leron Bentoven. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of the Glimpse Group, an AR VR company. And um, I would like to you to uh, just take the floor and introduce yourself. Thank you. And uh, as Jeff said earlier, kind of uh, doing this on Zoom, kind of I would have much preferred doing it in person. If you guys can uh, turn the cameras on, if you're in a place where you're comfortable turning them on, please do. It's way more fun kind of seeing your faces, seeing the reaction uh, and kind of feeling like I'm talking to a group of uh, students rather than just That's talking to them. A couple of people. So that's point one. Point two. Galang, may may nang pawa yung ano ayon? Tagalang. May ano? May nang presentation kasi sorry. Um, cause I can you mute yourself? I don't know who's that speaking. Sorry, sorry to. Okay, bye bye. Okay, we got the first student. Here we go. Exciting. <laughs> so good to see everyone. And again, I kind of I was actually teaching entrepreneurship at Fordham when the pandemic started as a kind of outside instructor. And it was so weird moving from in-person classes to Zoom and kind of took a couple of classes to convince everybody to turn the cameras on so it actually felt like I'm talking to people rather than sitting there staring at my screen. Uh, so again, if you can do that, the other is let's make it interactive. So don't wait till the end for questions. Ask me things as I'm talking about stuff. It's way more relevant, way more fun for me. Uh, it's kind of, it's evening. Uh, I've been working for... Uh, few hours uh, so let's make it fun so if you can kind of ask me questions you have things doesn't matter what interrupt me raise your hand and uh, let's make let's make it a fun interactive session okay so that's uh, that's my request of you and you can feel free to request anything of me uh, anything I'm talking about I, I can go much deeper and tell you a lot of fun stories about things just ask otherwise I'll just go through the presentation and you're like yeah that's okay uh, so let's do that uh let's see if you guys can see my presentation yep okay so what we're going to talk about is the opportunities that you guys have and you guys are very very lucky and we'll talk about that because you're coming out into the job market as a new tech cycle is happening and it's the best opportunity that you can have. We'll talk about what it means and where the opportunities are, but you're coming out into the world <coughs> at a situation where there are numerous opportunities. And if you guys position yourself right, you will have all of your great work years kind of uh, not only having fun, but making good money. So uh, definitely pay attention. Okay, so a little bit about me. <laughs> And uh, my name is Leron. I'm basically kind of a hybrid of a serial entrepreneur and an executive. So I go back and forth between kind of creating startups. Uh, Glimpse is my fourth real startup. Uh, and I call real is when uh, you pay other people to work for you. Uh, that's like the definition of real startup for me. And I've also kind of managed multiple public and private companies, uh, mostly in the tech sector, and actually been an investor in technology as well. So I've played the game from kind of the entrepreneur side, the executive side, and the investor side. And I've seen uh, things happen. And from my perspective, and this goes to the story of kind of glimpse, I grew up in the previous tech cycle. And unlike you, which kind of basically are coming into it at pretty good time in the cycle, I always chase my cycle. So the previous tech cycle, and you guys live in the results of it, was what I call the digital cycle. 
And the digital cycle started in the early 1980s. And usually tech cycles are 35 years. So from 1980 to 2015. And three main technologies together basically moved us Bus from riders, the analog. Not with Omni. When everyone does, this bus will move even faster. If you're not, uh, whoever is uh, making noise, please mute. Thank you. Uh, so three main technologies basically uh, came together to move us from the analog world, which was where we were pre-1980, to the digital world. Those are PC, mobile, and internet, if you give them like lay na names. And they moved us from a world where everything was analog. If you had to do anything, you have to physically do it. To a world today where everything we can do is digital, but it is a 2D digital, right? So everything we're doing, even this session right now is a 2D session. We don't feel like we're together. We're not immersed with each other, but we can have this call where everyone is sitting uh, wherever they are at home, uh, on campus, in kind of in my office, and we can all talk to each other. So the next cycle that started in 2015, which is what we're going to talk about, is what I call the immersive cycle. And three technologies that will talk much deeper about how they interconnect. Immersive technologies, that's VR and AR, together with blockchain and AI, are going to move us from a digital world where we are right now into a, a immersive world, which is where we're going to be throughout this cycle. So in 2015, I saw that this is happening. And I wanted to take the opportunity to come in first because in the previous cycle, when it started, I was in, in middle school. So yeah, I had kind of my computer, I wrote code, I did all this stuff, but early, but I was always chasing the cycle because I was always younger than what the cycle needed. I had a startup back in the dot-com days and those was fun, fun times. And, but, and I played in the cycle, but I was always chasing it. And I saw an opportunity to actually come ahead of the game and become a leader in this space rather than a, uh, a just a player. And that's kind of the opportunity that many of you guys will have because we are right now probably year eight of a 35 year cycle. So there's many, many years and all the fun is still to be had. And we'll talk about that uh, as we get to it. So when I decided that I wanted to play in this game, I was, the, the logical thing to do was either to find a company that was looking for a CEO or to find some technologist and kind of solve some problem in the space and do a startup. But because of the early nature of the industry, I wanted to do something different. And I built Glimpse, which is basically a collected collection of companies. So kind of obviously we started with a dream and we brought companies on. But Glimpse has multiple companies. Each one of them is focusing on different use cases. All those are enterprise, so B2B kind of, and if I'm saying anything you guys don't understand, raise your hand and ask, otherwise you'll never know. So don't be shy and ask questions and kind of you can put them in the chat or you can uh, just kind of raise your hand and ask them in your voice, which is even better. So we focus on helping organizations do virtual reality and augmented reality. So organizations could be healthcare institutions, could be hospitals, could be kind of uh, doctors, could be universities, could be K-12 schools, could be the government, could be corporations, kind of banks, kind of consumer companies. We work with all of these companies and bring solutions that, uh, that help resolve those. And we do that with our companies. You see the logos around our logo. Those are all of our subsidiaries companies. Each focuses on different technology, different use case, different market, but they all work together as part of the Glimpse family. All of those are part of Glimpse. We'll talk later very specifically about Exoterra, which is our company that helps kind of get people ready to become uh, XR professional. By the way, XR is a combination of virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, now, question to everybody. Do I need to go in and explain what VR and AR is, or this is basic stuff you guys already understand? Jeff, and help me out here. Um, maybe we can just give a, a brief overview. I think most people will know, but you never know. Maybe people who don't know might be shy. Yeah, no, kind of, by the way, kind of being shy, I will, I will give a brief explanation. Being shy doesn't get you places. So let's, uh, let's not be shy. 
Okay. Uh, kind of feel free to ask anything. Kind of, uh, kind of. If you don't feel comfortable asking it in in your voice, just kind of put it in the chat, and I'll relate to it kind of live as I'm talking. So let's explain kind of the terminology. Virtual reality basically allows you to go into a digital world. So we put together virtual reality. You access that putting a VR headset on. There's a variety of headsets created by multiple companies. You put the headset on, it basically covers your eyes. So you're not seeing the real world. You're basically seeing a created world and you're hearing the, the sounds of the created world. <coughs> and the way it captures you, basically your brain thinks you're there. And for those of you that haven't experienced XR, hopefully kind of, uh, and we're trying to work with the school to eventually open a kind of a XR lab, you'll get to experience that and kind of, and see kind of for yourself. But once you put that world, you're in a world that could be designed and manipulated and you can uh, immerse yourself in that world and interact with other people, with AI agents, with whatever is happening in that world. And your brain thinks that this is real for you. And it's one of those things kind of it's hard to describe until you actually go through it. But in virtual reality, you're disconnected from the world. When you look at augmented reality, you're basically adding a digital layer to the world with you. So you will see everything that you're seeing in the real world, but there will be digital assets that will be added to the world. The way to interact with augmented reality is either using your phone, and I'm sure many of you have used AR on like snap lenses and things uh, of that nature, or using AR glasses that allow you to add an augmented layer to the world you're in. And uh, when we talk about XR, it's basically the combination, it's basically extended reality, it's VR and AR together is XR, at least that's the way the world's looking at that. Is that okay? Can everybody get it now? Good. Okay, so we talked about kind of what I wanted to achieve, and we talked about kind of what Glimpse is. So I founded Glimpse in 2016, kind of shortly after I kind of basically decided that this is what I want to do. And it was a startup with basically a dream and uh, myself and a couple of founders. And basically kind of five years later, kind of uh, we took the company public. So uh, for those of you that like kind of uh, starting companies, uh, if you wish it hard enough, you work hard enough, you actually get there. So this is us uh, celebrating uh, on NASDAQ kind of when we uh, uh, went public. And as you can see, we got a pretty cool ticker too. Uh, that's what happens when you're first. You get to choose. So we have VRAR as our ticker. Uh, that, that was a fun experience. That was definitely something I wanted to uh, to do in my career. And I was kind of very proud to kind of basically work with a great group of people and actually get there. Uh, so that's uh, that's the, the journey we took. And uh, obviously, kind of this is just the first step in our journey. And we're continuing to uh, to move forward with what we're trying to do. So let's go back now into where, where this all started. <coughs> so I was talking earlier about the book, uh, Snow Crash. You can see that kind of highlighted here. The book was written in 1992 and it's a really, really good book. And right here, this is the quote of where the metaverse first was written. So kind of everybody's talking about metaverse and all the hype and all that stuff. This was written in 1992 way before kind of just the previous tech cycle was just beginning. I assume most of you guys were not even uh, on this planet uh, when that was written. So uh, kind of, you can see kind of where it came and everything that happened post is basically people taking that kind of vision that uh, Neil Stevenson had in his book and slowly and carefully converting that into reality. Okay, so Snow Crash, highly recommended. Uh, Ready Player One is a book that came out uh, probably uh, 10 years ago, so eight years ago. Really good, fun read. The movie, there's a movie for Ready Player One, which is a good movie, but the book is a hundred times better. It kind of gives you a lot more world because there's all, only so much I can do in a movie. So even if you've seen the movie, go read the book. You'll, you will enjoy it. Highly recommend. Okay, so Throughout this presentation, I'm going to throw some quotes from uh, people that kind of basically talk about where this the vision. So everybody is kind of understanding where we might be going, but nobody really knows where we're going. So kind of there's a lot of smart people that are all trying to figure out where are we going and why are we going there. 
So uh, I assume kind of a lot of you guys have kind of basically kind of seen the whole trend of Web3 and decentralization and kind of basically all the issues of big tech companies owning kind of the, uh, the web right now, whether it's Google or Facebook Meta and kind of and the like. And it's basically kind of as you look at the metaverse, most likely the metaverse will be a decentralized world. It will be something that is not owned by anyone. There'll be multiple worlds that all interconnect with each other. And that's kind of one of the essence of, I wanted to bring this quote from the CEO of Unity. By the way, if you haven't heard of Unity, Unity is one of the companies that creates a, a software language that allows you to basically build both games and VR experiences. So uh, we'll get to it later in terms of what you need to do but uh, if you're fluent in Unity, you're a good way on, on, on track to kind of a, becoming a developer in uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. So far, so good. Any questions, thoughts? You guys are very quiet. Okay, so this chart just shows how the uh, XR uh, industry has been growing in terms of dollars being spent. Okay, I see a question. Okay, that's a very good comment. Yes, Rob, you're correct. Uh, good comment. So you can see that the industry is basically growing constantly across all the different use cases. And we are very, very early in the cycle. It hasn't really started. Kind of, we are one of the largest companies in the space, and we are really small in the scheme of things. Yes, uh, Justin. Kind of, I strongly recommend owning a VR headset. The kind of it, it will give you a leg up uh, of understanding what it is. Uh, most companies want to hire people that are passionate about it. Doesn't matter if you can code or not. Uh, obviously, kind of. Uh, uh, you can do that. What I recommend is the uh, uh, Quest 2 by Meta. Uh, it costs, depends on the deals you get, under $400. Uh, very easy to use. Kind of, if you use a, small, uh, a smartphone, kind of, you'll get into it very quickly. And it's a really good untethered headset. Doesn't require a computer, doesn't require anything. Uh, very easy to use. And uh, you can get it anywhere, kind of on like Best Buy or Amazon or wherever you want to buy it. Uh, so that's what I recommend. And yes, kind of you guys should kind of, if, if you're interested in this industry, you should uh, kind of get a headset. Uh, if you want to do augmented reality, obviously you can do a lot of that with your phones. Uh, assuming you have a smartphone uh, of uh, any recent age, uh, probably anything in the last five or six years, you can actually do AR. Uh, those of you that use Snapchat, kind of all the snap lenses kind of are in a sense, they are, and many of them actually done by one of our subsidiary companies, uh, Curio. Uh, they do a lot of the advanced uh, snap lenses. Those are pretty cool. Uh, so less expensive than the Quest. The Quest is $400. It's probably as cheap as it gets for anything useful. Uh, kind of, there are things more expensive uh, that I can recommend, but uh, anything below that is not gonna give you a good experience. And uh, it's important to have a good experience. Uh, so the uh, Meta Quest 2 is the best kind of uh, the best one for value for money. Uh, and again, kind of if you wait for like holiday discounts and stuff, you can sometimes get them for like $300, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so moving forward. So uh, this is a survey done by Gartner and Nokia. And they asked about kind of where kind of what metaverse use cases and kind of what I want to do is kind of I'll, I'm going to go kind of into some of them and just talk about what they are and what they mean. That will give you kind of some examples about kind of use cases and where you want to go and what kind of you get passionate about. So not only kind of do I recommend you guys get headsets and get comfortable in that, that will allow you to pass interviews and kind of really know what you're talking about, but also pick the area that you're passionate about. If you're passionate about uh, marketing, that's a different opportunity than if you're passionate about creating uh, leisure gaming experiences and so on. Uh, so kind of really understand what you're into because when you interview for that job, 
knowing what it is, actually experiencing things that are out there will give you a leg up over kind of competition as you go into job interviews. So let's talk about education and training. So when I look at uh, use cases for uh, immersive technologies, education and training is one of the key elements that comes with that because you can recreate anything. So right now, imagine kind of, and all of you guys have been to high school recently, kind of, you all learned about ancient Rome. How did you learn about ancient Rome? You basically read books about it. You heard a teacher talk about it. Maybe you watched a couple of videos trying to depict that. That's kind of lame and boring. That's barely digital, kind of, uh, kind of definitely kind of just in with a textbook. Yeah, kind of, kind of how much of that do you feel like you've been there? How about if I took you to ancient Rome and let you walk around and actually kind of participate in what's happening there? I'm sure you will come back and say, oh, I know ancient Rome, you'll ace the test. And you'll remember that for the rest of your life because you've just been there. This is where education is going. We will build all these experiences and we will go on road trips to ancient Rome, to medieval England, to World War II. And we will be able to not just read about it or see some videos, but actually experience it. And that's a key element. And that's true for education <coughs> at all levels. So I've worked with uh, a lot of universities and colleges where we create simulations. Uh, you want to learn how to be an accountant. Kind of, well, kind of some things you can learn from a book, some things you need to have some experience. Why not go and do simulations? Uh, we're going to talk later about how AI comes into play, but we've now connected ChatGPT, which I assume all of you have heard about, into our VR experiences. So you can actually kind of basically tell any avatar, you are whatever you are, and they will kind of just do their thing and you can go talk to them. So you go to ancient Rome and I can put in a lot of AI that will be the Romans and you can just interact with them. And they will act like Romans and respond to your questions or run after you if you've done something bad and they want to catch you. Whatever it is, kind of that's how it's going to look. Yes, there are some colleges that are offering VR tours uh, of campus. And uh, a lot of colleges work with us to actually bring VR into their classrooms across all different things. And hopefully, uh, Staten Island will be one of them since we're kind of trying to kind of build that program together and bring those experiences into, uh, into the school. But this is where it's going. We're all very early right now, but kind of if you look at the later part of the cycle, when your kids go to school, they will be uh, spending a lot of time in VR learning about all those things that you basically kind of use some digital stuff. And when I went to school, it was all blackboards and uh, books. Uh, so kind of you can see the evolution of that. And kind of, this is a quote, uh, again, kind of, I'm going to kind of have those quotes in between that give you that, I'm not going to read those, you can read them as we talk about them, but you understand where you can use VR to simulate anything, allowing you to train employees and teach students across all levels, whether you're learning how to be a plumber, or you're learning how to be an accountant, or you're learning history or geography, and you really get to experience it. Another thing that uh, we can do uh, very effectively today, uh, I see a comment from Rob. Uh, VR and AR scans of historical sites like Notre Dame to create virtual models, yes. Uh, futurist is actually kind of someone that their job is to think about where the future is and then bring that knowledge into their organization. I actually have one in my organization too. And uh, one of my executives is our chief futurist. And uh, kind of his kind of his job and is to kind of think about where the world's going and make sure we're positioned correctly for that. Uh, yeah, so if you're into that world, kind of that job, that job will just become more and more uh, common as we're really kind of starting to ramp up into the future. So meetings and events. So right now we're doing this Zoom session. I don't feel like I'm in the same space with you guys. I see a few of you guys on video. I can hear the rest of you, but it doesn't feel like we're together because, but it's still a great accomplishment because I can actually talk to you guys not being where you are, which I couldn't do kind of 50 years ago. But 
down the road, we will, and the technology exists right now, one of our companies, Fortel, has meetings for that. We'll be able to meet in virtual reality and kind of all see each other as avatars and interact with each other and kind of do everything we're doing together. The absolutely is yes, kind of VR is already kind of part of this and it's going to be the future of everything we're, we're going to do because it just gives you such a big advantage. Uh, when you do things in VR, when you guys get to experience VR, you will talk about them like you've done them rather than you've seen them. So if I show you a, a movie about kind of World War II, you're not gonna go back home and tell your parents, oh, I was in World War II. You basically say, look, we sat in a room and we watched a scene from this battle. If I put you in the battle, you will go back and you will talk about it like you were actually fighting that battle. You will talk about it from a first person experience and your brain will experience that and it will be part of the things that you've done. So that is super critical when you're training uh, everyone. Okay. So meetings and events, a lot of meetings and events right now have evolved from in-person into Zoom. The advantage of those is doing them in virtual reality or in augmented reality. So augmented reality, you'll basically bring people that are not in the meeting into the meeting. They'll sit in a chair. I'm sure what most of you have seen Star Wars. You remember the Jedi Council when the uh, Jedis that were not physically there kind of were holograms in the meeting. That's how AR will create meetings. So there'll be meetings that people will be in person and then other people will be joined kind of as holograms. And then some meetings will just be in VR and people will join them from wherever they are. So many times kind of movies kind of basically depict science and then kind of the scientists go create whatever they see in the movies. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you've seen in Star Wars and Star Trek kind of, we're all building all those things right now. Uh, VR is just one big hologram, uh, holodeck. So kind of, this is all happening. Yes, so Kathleen, uh, holograms are XR. They're basically augmented reality, kind of you're basically adding, uh, kind of the holograms are basically capturing the asset and then projecting it as an augmented reality layer on reality. So uh, a big element of use of immersive technologies is marketing. It's already happening right now. Uh, if you think about how do you uh, let consumers interact with your brand and obviously kind of uh, a lot of companies have evolved into using immersive technologies to allow you to interact with their brands. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys have used Snapchat. That's a great example where you can take a product <coughs> and interact with it. You get a feel that you're having it in, in front of you. It's, if the product is done really well, you almost feel like you had it. So our company Curiel used to uh, do a lot of work with uh, the food industry and restaurants. And uh, when they started, they created a lot of burgers and they had really good augmented reality burgers. And uh, what happened is when we, I would have investors or potential business partners come to the office, we would show them their assets. And I had multiple times people would text me or call me kind of a couple hours later. And it's like, guess what I'm having for dinner? It's like, yeah, I know what you're having for dinner. You're having a burger. And because it gets, it goes into your mind in a totally different way than a picture does. Okay. So marketing is a very, very big uh, opportunity and will allow brands to create ways of bringing you in. So if you look at kind of like a brand, a brand like Coca-Cola, so I'm sure everybody knows the Coca-Cola polar bear uh, Christmas uh, ad, right? So in 2D, you just watch it. Imagine you can actually go in and go play with a polar bear in that world. How much of a different, uh, of a different impact it will have on you and your perception of the brand if you can go in and actually interact with the brand. Yes, the movie Minority Reports, kind of a lot of the data stuff, this is augmented reality, and this is uh, eventually will be part of our lives. So this is, this is the direction we're going. Okay, another kind of obviously element is uh, architecture, engineering, construction. 
like in most things, there is kind of two ways to go around it. One way is obviously kind of using VR to see buildings before they're built so you can experience them, see what's right and wrong, allow the architects, the owners, the builders to understand what they're doing. The other is there will be a whole new business of building virtual buildings and designing virtual offices. So I believe that probably kind of 10 years from now, we will not have physical offices. Right now, so if you look at the two ways of working, so historically we all worked in offices and then the, the pandemic really opened up the whole remote work and we work remotely, we go on meetings on Zoom and each one of those has advantages and disadvantages uh, versus each other, right? So kind of, if you're remote working, you miss out on being part of like a kind of whole group of people in the office and the office culture and all the fun. And obviously there's something about physical meetings that works, but you get the benefit of a more flexible schedule. You're kind of, you can control your own time. You can work for, you can live anywhere. You don't have to live kind of where the office is and all sorts of advantages. I think our future will be combining them uh, together. So we will have virtual offices where everyone can work remotely, but you will be in the office all day. So you'll be in VR, you'll have your own office space and you'll be able to walk around, talk to your peers, chat about personal stuff, about work stuff. People will come visit your office, but you will do all of that while being remote. So kind of, you can imagine that, that future and don't restrict yourself to our office, virtual office will look like a real office, just virtual because there's no constraints of cost or physics. You can build all sorts of crazy offices, and I think some people will, and there'll be a whole industry of architects and, and, and 3D designers that will build these worlds. And that's, those are opportunities that will happen uh, that you guys can take advantage of. Yes, so what happens in tech cycle, and Justin, that's a really good comment. What happens in tech cycles is that uh, the first half of the cycle and again, go back to the previous uh, cycle, is a hardware cycle. So what pushes the development is that hardware gets better and better until it gets to the point where it's mass adopted. So if you look at the first computers, the first cell phones, kind of uh, the first kind of built to serve the internet kind of with modems and was very slow and look at where we got, we will see the same in VR and AR. So we will see major advancement because right now, the only reason we don't have virtual offices is nobody wants to spend 10 hours in a VR headset every day. I'd rather commute into Manhattan than spend 10 hours in a headset. But once the headset become something that doesn't bother you, you'd rather be anywhere you want and still be in the office. So that's where hardware is going to push the, the limits on what we're doing. Now we're, we get to some of the fun stuff, travel. And travel kind of, I put it here, but it's kind of entertainment. So right now, when you want to travel, you need to go somewhere. You're spending a lot of money and a lot of time doing the things you don't want to do, right? So if you look at travel, you want to be in a different place with your friends or family. The last thing you want is to spend a lot of hours in the airport and on a plane. You don't want to spend for hotel nights and you don't want to kind of spend time driving kind of cars or taking an Uber or taking a train. All those things cost money, take time, and they're not part of the fun of the experience. Imagine if you can travel everywhere, anywhere, with anyone for any period of time without spending any of that time or money on this. This is the future. People will build virtual worlds that will sometimes depict real worlds. Sometimes they'll depict fictional worlds. And sometimes they'll be kind of just places where you can just kind of go and do certain things. So you'll have a virtual Paris, a historical Paris, a kind of uh, virtual kind of a Star Wars world where you can kind of hop between places and all look like that. All of those things kind of will push the limits of what it means to travel. Yes, so Rob, that's a very good uh, kind of comment. It's the big tech is obviously playing in the cycle, all of them. But what's pushing it forward are actually the small individual startups and creators that are pushing it forward. Not only that, when you look at history, the people that win 
are usually not the people that won the previous cycle. Many of the people from the previous cycle will become players, <coughs> but we don't know who the winners will be. And definitely I'm building my company to try and be a winner, but you don't know kind of uh, it's a, uh, but it usually is not the companies that won the previous game. So if you look at the previous game, even at the beginning, it usually started with a hardware cycle. A lot of names that you guys probably heard about, but are not big deal for you. Most of the big winners in the cycle, Google and Facebook and Apple, they, they have played a different role at the beginning or they didn't exist. So that's an important point to understand. So this is a comment from the uh, chief product officer for Roblox about uh, kind of how he sees the vision of where this metaverse is gonna be and how it's gonna impact us. Okay, so that's a question that, uh, that everybody is asking. And uh, so how far away the metaverse is? And kind of whenever people say, oh, the metaverse is here and kind of, they don't understand what the metaverse is. <coughs> The, the truth is, and kind of seems like most people get it, we're probably five to 10 years away from the metaverse. So if you look at when we really get there, that's usually when we'll hit mass adoption, in, which is the middle of the cycle. So we're probably seven, eight years away from, from really having that vision of what we're talking about. But all these experiences could be done right now. I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions, thoughts. But it's really good that you guys are kind of chatting with me as I'm talking. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I don't know where you got the earnings decline. Kind of, uh, we IPO'd at 3 million revenue and we're now at 15. So that's increase of 500%. But uh, I obviously kind of, I'm working hard to make my stock price go up, but I have no control over it. And uh, I can't make any comments on it. You yeah. can start to purchase land in your home space in the metaverse. Yes and no. The metaverse doesn't exist yet, so you can't buy anything on the metaverse. You can buy things on uh, kind of uh, people that want to sell you stuff in their real estate, like the central land. But there's no one that knows if the central land will be worth anything. So. Uh, uh, you can, I was told you can purchase my address in the metaverse. No, you can't. The metaverse doesn't exist. Uh, and kind of whoever's selling it to you doesn't have any authority to sell that to you. Uh, they can sell you something and if it works, it might work for, the, for you, but most likely this will disappear before the metaverse will exist. I, I do not recommend spending any money on that. Uh, there's always people trying to sell you stuff. Real estate is a very interesting, uh, obviously real estate is only valuable uh, when you buy it kind of where it is, right? So if you had a uh, acre in Manhattan, that's worth a lot, right? Uh, if you have an acre in South Dakota, that's worth a lot less. If you have an acre in the middle of the Sahara Desert, probably worth nothing. So you don't know right now what's going to be Manhattan, what's going to be South Dakota, and what's going to be the Sahara Desert in the metaverse that will happen. So anyone selling you an acre of land, Think twice, probably think 20 times before you buy it, because you don't know. Uh, imagine buying an acre in Manhattan when kind of Manhattan was empty. That's a pretty good investment. Uh, I think we bought it from the Indians, but kind of buying the same acre in the Sahara Desert back then, thinking that deserts would be pretty cool, would have been a really bad investment. So Said is asking, uh, what's the difference between the metaverse? And uh, the questions are popping up, so let me get back to it. And uh, what's the difference between the metaverse and virtual reality? So virtual reality, as I explained, is the ability to go into a virtual world using a VR headset. Uh, the VR world and the metaverse will be basically a combination of all these worlds combined. Uh, and we really will have the metaverse when you can actually move between these worlds and kind of have your identity, your assets, all the different elements. And we'll talk about some of those as we continue with the presentation in, in, in the space. So the metaverse will have a VR element, but VR is not the metaverse. Hopefully that helps that. Uh, is it all going to be privatized or how we apply for uh, equities? That is a really good question. And a lot of people are trying to figure it out. 
So my view, and there's a lot of different opinions on that, is that the metaverse will have, it will almost change kind of how we look at countries. So if you look at the world right now, there are democracies, there are kind of uh, countries that are communist, there are countries that are totalitarian, there are countries that are monarchies, different type of countries and people, usually they don't have a lot of choice, but they live where they are. And if they can move between countries, they move to countries that fit more what they want to do. I think in the metaverse, we'll have a lot of worlds. Some of these worlds will be owned by corporations. So there'll be a Disney world or a uh, meta Facebook world. And they're all or, already working on building these, but there'll be worlds that will be actually owned, they'll be decentralized and owned by the people that make them. And some worlds will have kind of will feel almost like democracy and you can be part of ruling your world. And some worlds will be owned by people that built them and you come in if you want to and you play by their rules. So different worlds will have different uh, elements in them. And again, if I'm saying anything you want to follow up questions, feel, feel free to ask those. Uh, Justin, do you see the possibility of some sort of technology for VR where our consciousness gets transported into the metaverse? Oh, we're getting into really cool questions. Uh, yes, uh, I think down the road, uh, and it depends on how you do that, but I think kind of, and that's probably kind of further out than our time, uh, but if you look at people that will spend all their time in the metaverse, so think about your kid's generation, and they will basically grow into the metaverse. They'll be part of their life. They'll spend all their life there. When they come of age, there'll be a collection of knowledge about what they do and how they do to the point that they can probably be recreated. And future generations could hang out with, with them kind of forever in the metaverse. That Again, me thinking that that's where it's going to go, but I can see how technologically that could happen. Uh, Kathleen, does this require equal access to high-speed internet? Really, 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 really good point. And I'll kind of have a slide about that, but high-speed internet, super high-speed internet is what's gonna allow the metaverse to happen. We're talking 5G and down the road, 6G and 7G. Uh, I actually kind of uh, worked on a uh, thinking group that I was invited to uh, by the OECD, I don't know if you guys heard of the OECD, it's the Organization of the Economic uh, Advanced Countries. And uh, I was invited uh, along with uh, some executives and a lot of uh, professors about how do you make rural uh, uh, parts of the OECD equal opportunity. And I came in as like the virtual reality expert. And what I said is if the government can give high speed internet access to everyone, you will create that equality because people can work anywhere. You don't need to come to New York anymore to get a job. You can be anywhere you are and you can still get any job you want. Uh, so that's kind of the direction. And uh, I think they, 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 they like my recommendation. We'll see what they do with it. Uh, Rob, uh, we need a global metaverse platform. Facebook markets, like they will own the space, they will not. Uh, but in the future, it won't be one company, but a larger infrastructure. Yes, kind of nobody will own that, just like nobody owns the internet. Uh, it will be a collection of worlds. Uh, Facebook Meta will build their own world, and the people that want to go there will go there. <coughs> but there'll be hundreds and thousands of other worlds that will be built, and people can go where they want. And there will be a, kind of the metaverse will be the connection of all of these. So where we can go as ourselves, using our identity, taking our virtual assets and moving between those worlds, that's when we will really have a metaverse. Kathleen, that sounds like a really good uh, topic. Kind of, uh, actually, I'd love to read what you wrote about it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of companies, I'm actually working with a couple of startups that are looking to build uh, something that will start allowing that to happen. Uh, so that, that's pretty cool. Okay, good engagement. Jeff, you're worried. They're, they're totally into it. Yeah, please, please send it my way and uh, kind of my email will be at the end of the presentation. So feel free to send it to me. Uh, I'd love to read it. <coughs> okay, so we talked about some very small sampling of what the metaverse uh, will look like, but let's talk about what technologies come into play. And we can attach on all those. So blockchain. 
So let's talk about blockchain and blockchain will allow for three key things in the metaverse. It's probably the engine that will run the metaverse and putting all the hype aside, it's a critical piece of that. Uh, so the three things that blockchain will allow is one identity verification. So we will own our identity, we will own our data. And the way we will do that is using blockchain technology. When you come into my virtual office, I need to know who you are. You can't just be, you can look whatever way you want to look if I allow that. But you have to, I have to be able to verify that you're the employee I hired or you're the visitor coming to visit me. In some places, if you go to a virtual club, you might be able to hide your identity and nobody would know who you are. But in certain situations, people need to do that. So identity management is one. The next one is management of uh, digital assets. All these worlds will be uh, full of digital assets and they will all be NFTs, not in a speculative way where they kind of basically people speculate on them, but because they will have certain values, certain properties, certain look and feel and ownership. And all of these will be governed as an NFT on these assets. And when I say assets, it could be anything, it could be a cup, a cup in a virtual coffee place. That will be an NFT. There will be hundreds of them, but all of them will have certain uh, look. They will break if you throw them or not in different worlds. They will be owned by someone and something will happen kind of to the owner. Or they could be able to kind of hold coffee. And then if you drink coffee, that coffee will go down. All these things will happen as part of that. And the last one uh, tied to the uh, blockchain is obviously global currency. We're talking today about the opportunity to work in immersive technologies, but there will be people that will work in the metaverse, not in creating the metaverse. People will be guide tours in ancient Rome. So if I build ancient Rome and there's a lot of cool things to see, some person and that person could be anywhere in the world will have their job as a guide tour that people will come in and they'll take you around and show you kind of all the cool places and they'll get paid. <clears throat> and they will get paid in a digital currency. So that's a, uh, a, the third element of blockchain in this world. <clears throat> Next one, and my favorite is AI. So all these worlds will basically be run. Yes, so kind of some of these uh, guide tours will be AI, and this is exactly where we're going, but some of them would be humans kind of, so there'll be advantages and disadvantages of AI versus humans. And kind of humans will work in the metaverse, just like AI will basically capture, and this is exactly my point, AI will run most of the metaverse. And not only run the metaverse, AI will probably build significant part of the metaverse. You guys can augment that and work with them. But if you look at all the worlds that needs to be built, there's not enough workers in the world in the world. And even if you convert all of the technologists and all of the artists to really build the metaverse, for the metaverse to really come to life in the vision that everybody has, it will be built by AI. And there's already kind of advancement and AI is already building kind of 3D assets and 2D assets and pictures that come from nowhere. And eventually it will be building worlds. Okay. So th say that you, you're spot on. This is exactly what I was talking about. Uh, so there's, there's most of the stuff I've seen right now is 2D we are actually pushing the envelope internally to try and create 3D uh, using kind of basically kind of the AI capabilities right now. And I know that the AI companies are working behind the scenes to push the limits of, of the AI. So right now we're kind of in uh, GPT 3.5. Uh, what I'm hearing is GPT 4 is like dozens of times more powerful than GPT 3.5 and that will come probably next year. So we've actually kind of uh, connected, kind of, uh, we put a press release out in a couple of weeks, kind of chat GPT AI into our VR experiences. Uh, I actually kind of uh, chatted with a bartender, kind of a virtual bartender, and she actually offered to take me on a date, which was way easier than what it used to be in real life. Uh, so uh, it's happening. I think it's, uh, it, it's most powerful. Kind of, if you guys have not played with chat GPT, you have to go play with it until you, and give it the craziest task you can do. Go um, kind of wildest dreams 
and kind of you'll be shocked what he can do. Ask it anything, and you will be so surprised by what he does. It's like the most powerful thing ever. Uh, I, I, I've said it to people that what we've seen over the last month in terms of the evolution or the last couple of months of the evolution of, of uh, chat AI is probably one of the biggest technology leap we've seen in our lifetime. And that's a big statement. So uh, if you haven't played with it, go play with it. That's like, it, it is like the coolest thing ever. So we talked about blockchain and AI together with VR and AR. Those are the main uh, the, the main building blocks uh, we talked about, and kind of your questions are always leading into the right direction. Talk about infrastructure, 5G and beyond. Without that, there will not be any metaverse. And obviously, kind of wearables and our ability to use headsets and eventually glasses, eventually contact lenses. And one day they'll probably plug something into our brains, but kind of luckily I won't be around to see that. Uh, so those are the key building blocks of this technology. <coughs> so I'm going to stop here. This is kind of like the overview of where the industry is and see if there's any more questions. I see Saeed has something. Uh, really good question, Saeed. Yes. So if you're learning AI, kind of you're already in pretty good space. If you're learning AR, VR, you're in pretty good space. If you know both, you're going to be worth your weight in gold. So I don't know how much you weigh, but uh, kind of probably worth something. So uh, that that's uh, that's a really good thing. If you have them both, kind of people will be lining out to kind of hire you. Uh, so this is kind of we talked about kind of how the future and how all the pieces come together. This is actually kind of showing the previous cycle. So you can see kind of how the previous cycle pushed technology, and that's the green uh, line, versus the rest of the economy. And we're going to see this again with the immersive technologies. So Olga is asking, where should I start my journey to become a VRAR professionally if I want to switch a career? Uh, it's by learning, and we'll talk about that's exactly what's going to come in the next uh, part of the presentation. If that question is still relevant, kind of ask it again at the end. But I think we're going to answer that. Uh, Kathleen is asking, do you know how the UX space might change? Uh, it, it, it's interesting. Everybody has thoughts on how it is. Uh, kind of right now, a lot of it is still what I would call kind of uh, converting 2D space to 3D UX. Uh, I think over time it will evolve into much more uh, different way of doing things. Rob, uh, C Sharp works great with Unity. There are a lot of tools that make much of it code usage. Yes. Uh, C sharp uh, is is a good is a good thing to know, and Unity is a great thing to know. And if you know kind of if you're good in both, even better. Uh, and one helps you get get to the other. Okay, so now we're going uh, about kind of what it means to work in XR. So first of all, demand for XR, and I'm going to say XR kind of AR VR, it's all the same. Talent is far outpacing supply. There is a real shortage out there for uh, professionals across the board. Obviously, kind of experienced people are hard to get because this industry has only been around for seven, eight years. Uh, and kind of there's a lot of demand across the board, and we'll show where, where it's coming from. So that's kind of the first theme. The second thing is there's not a lot of places where people are being trained in XR. And <clears throat> that's an opportunity kind of that uh, one of our companies is trying to take advantage of. And there's an undefined structure for career path in XR software development. And we'll talk about some of the career path shortly. So companies that are actively seeking, as you can see, anybody and everybody across the board, there is a lot of demand uh, for XR uh, professionals in tech companies and non-tech companies. So uh, block-based coders, uh, can they take advantage of AI, VR, XR? Interesting question. I'm not sure. Uh, kind of people with dyslexia, from what I've heard, actually kind of have a really good time becoming uh, XR professionals. For some reason, it, it kind of it comes naturally to them, uh, at least understanding that space. Uh, but I'm not an expert on that, just what I've heard. 
So what, what are they looking about? So those are kind of some recent job postings that are tied to XR. And as you can tell, they are all over the world. So you don't have to be a, a developer or an artist, even though those are the most common ones, uh, to find a position in this space. And uh, so everybody can find where they fit well. It could be on the uh, tech side in, in, uh, in developing. It could be on the art side in creating these worlds and designing them. And it could be on the project management side, on the uh, uh, creative side, on the business side. All of these are valid. Yeah, so kind of Rob, you're right. There's a lot of uh, opportunities to learn by yourself. If you're good at it, you can self-learn. Uh, Unity, Unreal, which is the other language, uh, is slightly harder to self-learn. But if you're a good programmer, that uh, that that works well. And if you want to kind of basically kind of take a speed course, there's kind of there's opportunities uh, to do that as well and get up to speed very quickly. And usually those open up opportunities because people go look for professionals. If you self-learn, kind of you still have to go find a job and prove that you've got it. If you take the program, kind of the employers will come find you and, and hire you and you already have that certificate. What is digital transformation developer? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I'm actually not sure. I can guess, because I didn't kind of put this together, kind of all the different positions. I can guess that basically it's someone that basically takes something that is happening in the physical world and creates a basically digital twin of it and kind of basically knows how to understand how to convert the physical to the digital. I am a VR, AR data support, trying to use past programming experience to learn C sharp and move into being an XR creator. That's that's the right path, Rob. That's that's what you want to do. <clears throat> okay, so let's kind of look about at, at some of the skills. So, uh, and we've touched on a lot of these. Kind of your questions are usually eating the presentation, which is good. Uh, so you've got on the uh, on the hardware software experience. So uh, game engines, Unity and Unreal are critical for anyone wanting to be a developer in the space. C Sharp is an experience. If you worked with the headsets, you're more likely to kind of get the jobs. Uh, if you've created 3D games, uh, that is a big established. Uh, and then you've got a variety of languages that kind of give you another kind of uh, leg up on competition. It is important that you guys, if you're into it, create some uh, portfolio of things to show. Uh, kind of the, even though there's a lot of demand, people want people that can get up to speed very quickly. So they want to see that you've created stuff and preferably that you've worked within a team. So a couple of stats on, uh, on the market. The, the, Kind of the, the amount of jobs out there is kind of is crazy. Kind of there's the, there's huge demand in jobs. Salaries are very high. Obviously, the median salary is more for experienced people, but even people coming out of school can make really really good uh, pay. And uh, and it's just like kind of the the demand is causing this industry to kind of pay a lot more than equivalent industry. Kathleen is asking, can you do this without majoring in computer science? Absolutely. But you need to know your stuff. So if you can prove that you know it and you can do it and you've done it, you'll get the job because there's so, such demand. So it's, it's not necessarily about the degree. It's about what you've done and what you can show that you can do. So having a portfolio is critical if you're not coming with a, a good degree. So a couple of slides on uh, Exoterra, which is our company that actually uh, helps people convert from being uh, developers and artists into being XR professionals. <coughs> and a couple of programs they're doing. So one thing they're actually working with high schools and giving uh, high school students uh, experience, first experiences in this and really establishing their connectivity into the industry and, and giving them a leg up to understanding where they're going. Uh, another one, they're actually teaching teachers how to use it. So teachers can then feel comfortable in the space and kind of help push that generation. And obviously kind of uh, what I've talked about earlier is they do classes for 
professionals that they already kind of established developers. So it's not starting from zero, but if you know how to develop for web or mobile, or you are a 2D artist, you can become a 3D artist or a uh, Unity or Unreal developer. So uh, that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation and I'm kind of losing my voice anyway. Uh, so uh, we actually don't train or they don't train college professors, they train high school professors, uh, high school teachers. Uh, but kind of we're happy to train kind of uh, college professors as well. Kind of the more people know about it, the better. Uh, let's see kind of some of the questions there. Uh, Rob, the problem is a lot of IT is getting enough experience to show employers. Uh, I'll try to get it down. Uh, those small indie projects and even things you write, Cape, uh, added portfolio to help you. Yes. He, obviously, if you have the experience, that's awesome. But if you don't, just build stuff, build a game, work and kind of show that not only that you're, you can do it yourself, but you work part of a team. Kind of the more you prove, the easier it is to get the job. There's a lot of jobs out there, but you need to show that you can actually do them. Uh, Sulman, will the future of XR shift away from native applications and toward web based such as WebXR? Yes, and even further than that, kind of, I think the future is uh, what NVIDIA is building called Omniverse. So it will all be cloud-based. I, I, I think it, even within a few years, you will not have uh, native applications on the headsets, which is how most of the VR is done right now. And most of it will be on the cloud. Uh, I think that's the direction it's all going. Uh, I think there's a question I missed here. I'm not going to comment on my stock. That will put me in jail, and I'd rather kind of build a company than go to jail. Uh, so I'll, I'll stay out of it. But obviously, kind of, uh, I, I'm, I'm very, very happy with what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Uh, but I'm not making any stock recommendations. Definitely not my own. Uh, Yeah, so it, 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 the, for the metaverse to happen, and Rob, uh, this is a good point, it has to be centralized. Kind of, We have to have an ability to connect all these worlds, connect all of these individuals, connect all these assets, and kind of you'll have to get standard. There's already kind of multiple standard boards that are beginning, uh, that companies in the industry, including ourselves, are going into to try and kind of get this from a bunch of people doing whatever they feel like to a group that is working together to build the metaverse. Really good engagement. I'm really excited about the comments, the questions, kind of a very, 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 very fun session. So I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll take a few more questions if you guys have them. Uh, just before I get to that, kind of, you've got kind of obviously my email and my LinkedIn here. Feel free to connect with me if you're interested. Uh, and uh, happy to kind of uh, to hear how you guys are kind of evolving and uh, hope to see many of you guys in the industry uh, a few years from now. See uh, if I were I missed questions. Yeah, if I, uh, if I can just make a few announcements before we wrap up. You know, first and foremost, just thank you so much for giving such a engaging session. Thank you to the students and Katie for also being so engaged. Uh, I I still want you to answer those questions. I just want to just say a few things. Um, First and foremost, we just want to give a uh, thank you to our sponsor, Verizon. Uh, Verizon uh, sponsored this program, or to say these this workshop series, to help bring um, professional development in the tech space to high school and college students, where they focus on diversity. And so with that being said, I would like to share a form with you guys. If you guys could just take a few moments just to fill it out. Um, you know, this could help us and help us to continue having support um, to create more programs like this. If you guys like this, please fill out this form. Um, secondly, also, um, this is for the for those who are CSI students on the call. How do we have high school students and maybe just some working professionals? Um, this this workshop is eligible for clue credits. Um, Camilla, if you don't mind just resharing the link to fill out the form for the clue credits, we will send a follow up email with the form from, from Verizon and for the clue credit form. Also, if you guys could just fill that out now, that would be nice. Um, and lastly, I want to give a special shout out to one of our cohort companies called Awesome Tech. Um, ironically, we are on this call talking about building AR VR. Um, Ms. Darlene, our uh, first startup is about uh, providing um, education in the AR VR space to uh, students with autism. So the thing here is that 
after uh, students with autism graduate from high school, they typically have nowhere else to continue learning computer science and programming. So she created a program that's teaching um, kids with autism. So if anyone is interested in learning more about Awesome Tech and the work that they're doing with AR, VR education with people with autism, uh, please connect with Darlene or you can look up Awesome Tech. Uh, Darlene, do you want to put your website in the chat? Perfect. You got it. And thank you so much. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I really want to learn more about this. I'm trying to figure it out myself so I can roll it out to my students. So um, any, you know, anyone that would like to volunteer and uh, come along and help teach the college slash high school professors. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so we Mr. can Lee, definitely please, use it. <laughs> Mr. Lin, please email me. I'll connect you with Hakan, who runs Exartera. He's working with companies, including Verizon, actually. Mm -hmm. that basically they fund basically a lot of these programs to, to, to teach the teachers. So potentially kind of we can get that done for you guys kind of on their dime. So uh, email me and I'll connect you with Hakan and then uh, he'll figure out how to kind of help you get as much kind of funding for training kind of professionals in, in XR as, as we can do. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to touch on the last few questions. If we got time and then uh, yes. kind of say goodbye to everybody. Uh, so uh, Sayed is asking, do you think it's better for people to focus on learning specific skills like character design or virtual world building, or should they try and gain a broader understanding of the entire metaverse ecosystem? I think you should focus on specific skills because then you can find job in it. And then over time, as you kind of grow professionally, you can kind of get a broader understanding. If you kind of try and do too much, you won't find anything and then you'll just know a lot, but uh, you won't be employed. And we already kind of figured that you're worth your weight in gold. So definitely go after a specific skill. Kathleen is asking, how does this relate to machine learning? Will AI interact in metaverse beyond human awareness? Yes, I think AI will be running a lot of these worlds and learning about what works and what doesn't and making adjustments. Uh, it sounds scary, but I think that's where it's going. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Darlene and I commented about that, and I think if you can email me, I'll connect you to Hakan later tonight or this more, tomorrow morning. And uh, let's see what else uh, questions. I think that's it. Awesome. So, I really enjoyed it, really engaging, uh, a lot of really good questions and comments. And uh, Jeff, thanks for putting this together. and. Uh, I hope all of you guys will find your spot in this industry. It's going to be a really fun ride. Yes. No, thank you so much. And, you know, once again, it was a truly an honor and a privilege to have you. Hopefully we could bring you back or someone part of your team. I think, you know, you were so engaging and gave a lot of insight into the space and the future of the space. So just thank you so much. And um, thank you, everyone also at home for just taking some time to invest in yourself, invest in your knowledge. This is what we're really about. You know, we want to help you guys build yourselves up to be successful in the future. And um, we have uh, two more workshops coming up. We actually have um, another workshop about building a career in data science and AI. Uh, we also have another workshop about uh, building a career in software engineering. Ironically, the speaker is on the AR VR team from Facebook, well, Meta. So um, we have a couple more um, really good speakers coming up for you guys. So look out for those emails and, and thank you to you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks yeah. so much. Really appreciate it. Good, excellent work. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. This was amazing. Oh my gosh. Next yeah. one, I'm going to have some of my students join. <laughs> Please, they're invited to all the workshops. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, you too.